Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. achieve, achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, I am joined by author and tax strategist Don Thornton. Don is going to show you how to legally reduce your taxes to nearly 0% as well as protect 100% proof of your assets with his copyright trust. So we're going to be talking to him about that. And we all feel like we pay too much taxes. So we're going to get his expertise on that issue. Don, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me on. I love to talk about this. So I always like the opportunity to be able to share it with more people. Why don't you start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Well, like I said, my name is Don Thornson. I'm living in Orlando, Florida, where I've been since 1999. Like most people in Florida, where I'm from somewhere else. But we all managed to come down here. I've been a real estate investor for 20 years. I'm considered one of the leading short sale investors in the country. And that's really how I ended up learning about this tax strategy because as a successful investor, I mean, I don't remember one year where I didn't have to write a check to the IRS for something, you know, at the end of the tax year. And another another real estate investor said, Hey, you should hear about this. And he told me about it and I was blown away that such a thing existed because you think to yourself, well, I wonder why this hasn't been talked about more widely. And frankly, it's it's just been kind of like a word of mouth type thing for, for decades. Ultra rich have been using it and it's just now slowly starting to filter down to people of our level. And I checked it out, did my due diligence, realized that, you know, it was a reputable law, reputable law firm that has it and puts it together. And I said, I'm in. And then, you know, next thing you know, I mean, not next thing you know, but the first time I did my taxes after doing a, a year's worth of uh, using this strategy, no taxes, didn't pay them, zero. It was awesome. Well, explain to people how, how this tax strategy works and also let us know how it benefited your business. Well, obviously my business is benefited by not having to pay, I didn't pay taxes the first year I had it. So that's, that's the big thing. But I tell you, it's more, it's more important than that. They're, you know, the wealthy, the ultra wealthy have been using some variation of a spendthrift trust for as long as the United States has been in existence. In fact, the origins of this trust come from England as way back as, you know, as late as uh, Henry VIII, when, you know, there was, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds about that, but basically, you know, there was a land grab going on during during the Reformation when, when England broke away from the Catholic Church. And, you know, they were using the courts at the time as legal pre- pretext to seize Catholic landowners' lands and, and assets and so forth. And then, you know, as they, you know, as they tried to find a legal way to be able to get around that, they were they came upon first example of a spendthrift trust that was based on English common law. Over the centuries, it just kept being refined and, and changed, uh, modified, obviously, as it, as, as England expanded its empire, then it went to the colonies. That's how it wound up here. And then it just continued to be developed and refined over these years. And when the U.S., so that was, this was before the IRS was ever instituted as, a, as an institution in the 1930s. The rich were using this because this trust gives 100% lawsuit protection to any assets that are in there. You know, just to give you an example, you know, remember when OJ, you know, allegedly, because I guess he got, he got, uh, he got in, he acquitted in, in, um, you know, in the court, in the criminal case, allegedly killed, uh, you know, his ex wife and the waiter from the restaurant. You know, the, the, uh, the family sued uh, in civil court and won, I think it was like a $32 million judgment. I mean, they really, you know, stuck it to OJ. There was one problem he didn't have any assets. And the only assets he had were in a trust. He had sold them to a trust with a spendthrift provision, and they couldn't touch it. And they still can't touch it. And because that spendthrift trust, I mean, a trust with a spendthrift provision is so powerful that, you know, if, if you personally don't have any assets that you own yourself, that you've sold them to the trust, but you're the trustee and you have 100% control, but no ownership, they can't come after you as a private individual. They can't come up to you in your, in your capacity as a trustee. 
and it certainly can't get to the assets and the trust. So that has been the go-to mechanism, strategy, that the ultra-rich have used way before the tax code came into existence. Well, you know, I'm sure you know how this works in Washington. The politicians and their staff don't write the laws. Usually the lobbyists write the, write the legislation. And then, the, then they'll tweak it a little bit. But what happened was that obviously the oligarchs at the time, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, they volunteered to let their lawyers help write the tax code, the original tax code. Very nice of them, right? <laughs> and uh, But they, they, they put a code in the, IRS, in the IRS tax code that specifically had to do with this kind of trust. And it's called IRS Code 643, especially 643B. And it has to do with these trusts. And it basically gave the, these t- the owners of these trusts almost uh, almost complete uh, loophole or, or, or ability to not pay any taxes, any substantial taxes at all. And so they've been using this for decades. I mean, the trust that, that you know, the law firm that I, that I work with that has this trust, I mean, they've had, they've had this trust for over 50 years themselves, and, but it just never really gained any traction outside of that really small circle of ultra, ultra, ultra wealthy people. So what it does is in, with its compliance with IRS Code 643, it means that if I have an asset in my trust, let's say, for example, that I have an investment property as a real estate investor. Let's say I have a duplex. And I decide that, you know what, I don't want to be sued. I don't have any issues. Plus, I don't want to have to pay taxes on the rent that I get from both of those units. So what, what you do is the investor will sell that to the trust, but only at the price that the, that the property was bought at, minus any depreciation, because you don't want to trigger a taxable event by selling the property to the trust. So let's say if I had... If I bought the property originally at five hundred thousand dollars, let's say that I took maybe fifty fifty thousand dollars in depreciation, that means the sales price to the trust is going to be four hundred fifty thousand dollars, which is would be less than what it's worth now. So there'd be no taxable event on that. The trust does not give money for that; it gives a note, like a promissory note. Okay, all that matters is that we're going to get that, we're going to sell that property irrevocably into the trust, where I'm the trustee, for example. So I control it, but I don't own it anymore. So now it's not me personally that writes, signs the lease with my tenants. It's I sign it as trustee of whatever the name of the trust is. So now when I get rent checks in to the trust bank account, all those taxes are permanently deferred. They never get paid. And plus, nobody can, you know, anybody can sue anybody, but, you know, it's not going get, to get anywhere with a judge if a lawsuit is filed. So now what was before it was taxable for me personally, or if I had an LLC or something, that would be taxable money. Those rents come in. Now, no tax. It's permanently deferred. So and let's say I decide that I want to sell the property. So let's say that I want to sell it for, let's say, a million dollars. Say it's appreciated that time. I can get a million dollars for it. Now, normally, if you sell an investment property, that means that you're going to have to get hit with capital gains tax, and that's about 24%. So if I don't, if I'm doing this on my own, I'm going to sell the property, and then I'm going to have a tax bill of approximately two hundred eighty thousand dollars that I would have to pay the IRS. Or what I could do is try to find a, pro, a, a duplex that's similar in square footage, condition, price range. And then just kind of just do a swap. And that's called a 1031 exchange. The IRS allows that to happen to defer tax capital gains taxes from being paid. It's very, very difficult. You have to find a property and get, an, get it under contract within 45 days. And you have to close within 60 days. I have heard a statistic that said that less than 50% of 1031 exchanges ever work. And so you're stuck then if you if you can't find a, a property that meets all those criteria, you're gonna have to pay that two hundred eighty thousand dollars in taxes, capital gains taxes. Well, if it's a trust asset and you put that up for sale with the trust as the owner, you sell it, the money comes into the trust's bank account. Now, because the trust is in, in is in compliance with IRS code six forty three, that means that those that two hundred eighty thousand dollars that we would have paid in, ca- in capital gains tax, that, that money is deferred forever, permanently deferred as long as it stays inside the trust. 
So now, I mean, think about it. Go into it thinking that almost, you know, almost 30% of, of my profit is going to go to the IRS. So now because you had the foresight and knowledge to sell your property into the trust, now there's no tax permanently deferred. Are there any court rulings that, that, that show that this is legal? Yeah, absolutely. It has been, I mean, I've got in my ebook and, and on my website, I have all these, this, this information there. I'm not gonna, I can't quote it like right off the top of my head, but yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the thing about this is that, uh, you know, when you're talking about contract law and legislative law, a trust at its core is a contract. And, you know, just to quote from the Constitution, Article, you know, you know, Article One, Section Ten, where it says that no law shall shall be passed that would impair the obligation of contracts. And there's been a number of Supreme Court cases. I mean, I can just right off the top of my head, you know, you had Fletcher versus Peck, and I think it was 1810, where the legislature, the Georgia legislature, passed a law. A couple of land speculators were able to, you know, did what they did in accordance with the law. A year later, the legislator decided, you know what, we don't like this law so much, we're going to re- revoke it. And then that meant they said, well, that means your contracts are null and void. They took it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled, nope, doesn't matter if it's a bad law or not. It was legal at the time, and that's a contract, and, and it's a constitutional right that no state shall, shall get, in, you know, can impair the obligation of contracts. And then in 1911, Elliott versus Freeman, that was a, a Supreme Court case where they were ruling on a tariff that was going to be instituted federally and it went to the Supreme court and the Supreme court ruled that it only that law, that federal law only had to do with anything that was a, what we call a creature of the legislature, like a corporation, you know, LLCs, anything that the corporation, I mean, excuse me, the legislature had created. Whereas the trust is a private contract. And, it, and that ruling basically stated that this type of, this type of trust is in the realm of equity and is not there's no le- there's no jurisdiction you know of of that particular you know the the a legislative trust as opposed to a contract law trust so the sanctity of a con- sanctity of a contract is you know is held you know sacred in our in our society and so when you have a trust that's between two parties and it has nothing to do it's not an LLC. It's not a corporation. It's not you know a land trust, anything like that. It is a contract law trust. Then that means, and that, that's why IRS Code six forty three was was instituted to begin with because it is, it talks about these kinds of trusts. So the, the trust language is written so that it's in compliance with six forty three, and so that way you have no problems deferring any kind of. T- Capital gains taxes, for example, uh, without 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 had caused an issue with the IRS. In fact, the IRS issued a private letter ruling about that in the 1970s that stated that yeah, you know, it's in compliance with IRS 643 and it's fine, it's legal. Well, what mistakes are you currently seeing people make in their tax strategies? Well, what they're doing is they are relying on. Again, what we call legislative solutions that come from that are passed by the legislature, and really, that's kind of like where you're you're playing in someone else by someone else's rules. And I'm not saying I'm not trying to sound some radical that's saying, "Oh, don't pay taxes or whatever." I'm not. Every the trust that we have, you pay, you know, you file a tax return every every year, and if you don't follow the rules of IRS Code six forty three, then you're going to pay taxes. If I pay myself as a trustee, if the trust pays me money, I pay taxes on that. It strictly has to do with the fact the IRS will allow the if, as long as the money comes in to the trust as passive income and or from the sale of a trust asset and it stays inside the trust, then any taxes can be deferred permanently. But if I disperse to someone, let's say that I have a beneficiary and I give them write them a check for fifty thousand dollars, well, that's taxable. And that person's got to pay taxes. So, you know, you're using what is available to, you know, save, avoid taxes, but not evade them. I was making mistakes as a real estate investor because I did not know that this strategy was out there. And so I would say the biggest mistake of most people who are paying too much in taxes is because they are ignorant of the 
ways that you can legally do it. And that was my fault. I did, I did. I just assumed that there was nothing else out there or else I would have heard about it. And when I did hear about it, I felt like an idiot because I had 19 years of, of paying taxes, but I, I didn't have to if I didn't want to, but I didn't know. And so I would say the lack of education, lack of financial education is really a big factor in why people end up paying too much in taxes. Now, do you have to be like a real estate investor or have a lot of money, the average no. person make this work for them? Yeah, but I would say that, you know, the trust, I mean, they're not, I mean, they're not cheap, right? I mean, but I would say that the idea that only the really, really wealthy can have a trust is completely false. It's not accurate whatsoever. But let's talk about who can who can benefit from this. So first of all, I'm going to exclude a big group of people. If you are on a salary position and you get a W-2, then you can't, this will not work for you. Straightforward, full transparency, that's not going to work for you. So who will it, who will it help? Business owners, okay? Business owners that provide services or they sell products or whatever they do, you know, but they're, they are generating ordinary active income. And I know this because this was this, this was the kind of income I had because I was flipping properties. That's taxed at 32% if you have an income of more than $165,000, which I always did. That's a huge chunk, okay? It kind of, it's like having the IRS as, your, as, a, as a one-third partner, and the IRS doesn't do anything to help you. It just takes, right? So, so business owners, if you are a 1099 employee, I have a, I have a lot of people that I work with that are, that are in IT, and they make really good money, but they're not, they're paid as contractors. They're not paid as salaried employees. So again, if, I mean, I have one guy I spoke with recently. He says, yeah, I make about $900,000 you know, net income as a 1099 person, but he says, I'm getting killed with taxes because it's you know 32%. So that's well over $300,000. So those people can definitely be helped. Doctors, if they have their own private practices, dentists, anybody in the medical profession have their own private practices. Absolutely. If you're a real estate agent or a mortgage broker, if you get commissions, any kind of commission type revenue is active income. And, and you can definitely, definitely. That. And then that's just active income. If you're an investor, if you have crypto, if you have stocks and bonds, if you have, if you invest in Forex, if you invest in, in precious metals, you know, if you've got income, that kind of income coming in, that's taxes, capital gains, which we already talked about. So those people can benefit from this. So like I said, the only people that can't are salary employees. So tell people about your books. Tell us what we can expect when we read them and where we can okay. get Okay, sure. Well, in my, in my book that I wrote last summer, because I really felt like there was a lot of, you know, if you did find the information, I mean, no offense to the accountants and the attorneys out there, you do a great job. But for a layman, it was like, I'm going to fall asleep or I got to read this thing 20 times where I kind of figure what, out what it is. So I realized that there was a need to be able to take this strategy and explain it in very simple terms so that most people who don't have a, fin a finance background would understand. And so what I endeavored was to be able to explain this to my 14-year-old son and say, now do you understand it? And so I did that and I broke it down exactly kind of how I'm explaining it right now. And I walk people through exactly how you, you know, what the trust is, a little bit of the history. And then we go into the fact that this type of trust has five different, we call them pillars of that have to be there for it to be, to be able to get the, the asset protection and the amazing tax reductions that you can get from working with this trust. It's called the official name of the trust is a non grantor, irrevocable, complex, discretionary, spendthrift trust. So all five of these pillars work together to produce that result that I just that I just described. So I walk through and explain why each one is so important, but it's like a, maybe a paragraph maximum, two paragraphs, just to say this is this is really all that matters. It gives you this, this gives you this, this gives you this, and so on and so forth. Then I talk about briefly about how you set it up, how the trust is set up, how you're named trustee, and how you sell your assets into the trust and how you set things up. And then I talk about how if you have passive income from investments, how this works to be able to avoid capital gains legally and defer it permanently. Then I show people who have a business, like the people that I told you about, 1099 employees, people like that who have active income. 
I'll show you how you can convert that into passive income for the trust. And you can legally convert as much as 97% of your income, your, your, your net income of your, like say, LLC, for example, get it to the trust. And, and most of that, almost all of that can be converted to, to permanently tax deferred income. And then what's really exciting for people is like show them that the trust can pay for almost everything that you have in your life. If you if you sell your your home into it, your vehicles, any other thing like that, any assets, well, the trust has to pay for them. They're trust assets, so they're expenses. So I show how all that money that's coming in that's not being taxed can pay for your house, can pay for your insurance, can pay for you know any repairs, put a new swimming pool in, you know, for your car, pays for all the gas, oil changes, repairs. If you if you decide that you want. Hey, you know what? I want to get a Corvette. I got. I feel a little bit old. I want to. You know, when it gets, I'm going through a midlife crisis or whatever. The trust buys it. If as long as there's money inside the trust bank account, the trust will buy it. And now it's a trust property, which means the trust has to maintain and pay for everything about that. If you have children, it pays for almost everything: their education, their food, their clothes. You know, culture, health, insurance doesn't matter. It pays for that. And so for, for most of the beneficiaries who are older than 21, it pays for almost everything as well. I'd say probably 90% of what we, what we do in our lives can be, can be considered a trust expense. So when you realize, and I go through this in my book, and I show everybody when you realize exactly what this does for you and, and how, how amazing it is from asset protection, you know, amazing legal reductions in taxes and how you can start paying for almost everything with pre-tax dollars, you start thinking to yourself, why in the world would anybody not do this? And that's all covered in the book. Do you have any current or upcoming projects that you're working on that people need to know about? Well, I tell you what I'm doing is I'm going to, I'm really starting to get this out there. I'm going to be in some, invited to some, some very interesting conferences to get on the stage and talk about this. I don't have the dates set yet, so I can't really announce them, but that's coming. But I do believe that you're going to see me around. If you, if you follow me, you're going to see me around in a lot of places talking about this because I've noticed a distinct upwelling of interest in this that not, I didn't even have even four months ago. The last three weeks have been off the charts. I'm being, I'm being invited on podcasts all the time. Be invited to speak because there. I don't know if it's coincidence or not, but you know the, the the administration passed the Inflation Reduction Act, and it raised taxes for people who make more than four hundred thousand dollars a year. And there's a lot of people that are now looking for ways to reduce their taxes legally. And I think it's now in the front front of their mind and awareness. And they're looking and they're finding. I mean, they find me on on YouTube, social media, TikTok, Instagram. Facebook, LinkedIn, I'm all over the place. And they're coming to me saying, tell me more about this strategy. So I would say just, you know, find me on social media and uh, you'll be able to, to know what's going on. That was my next question. Throw out your contact <laughs> information, website, social media, where people can follow you. Right. Well, I'm on, I'm on TikTok at, at Ironclad Trust, I-R-O-N-C-L-A-D Trust. It's my TikTok handle. And then on YouTube, if you just type in Don with my spelling, D-O-H-N, and just infinite wealth strategist, you'll find my web, you'll find my uh, YouTube channel. And then every, any, anywhere you, you find me on social media, you're going to see my website. And I'll give it to you right now. It's, finan- it's HTTPS colon slash slash financial freedom, the number four, the letter U dot now, N-O-W dot S-I-T-E. And you know what? I'm, text me. I'll give you my phone number. I have no problem with people texting me. My number is 407-902-7827. That is my personal cell phone. Don't, don't be shy. Send me a text. So you want to you know more about it. Absolutely. Give that website out one more time and then close us out with some final thoughts. Maybe something that I forgot to touch on that you would like to talk about or just sure. any final thoughts you have for the listeners. Okay, my website again is https colon slash slash financial freedom, the number four, the, the letter U, like Utah, dot now, that's N O W, dot S I T E, financial freedom for you, dot now, dot site. And uh, I, would, I will say that I'll just give an example. And this, 
know, because I want I want to talk about two different people real quick. I have a business owner who was going to sell his business for seven point five million dollars. He saw me on TikTok. He he saw that you know I showed him how he could legally defer his permanently defer his capital gains taxes from the sale of his business. He reached out to me. We were able to get him a trust, taught him how to do it, and he sold his business. And whereas he would have owed one point seven five million dollars in capital gains taxes. He didn't have to pay them. They stayed inside his trust and he was able to use those for expenses and other investments and so forth. And he was extremely happy about that. Now I'm going to go to the other extreme and talk to you about this, this woman that she worked for a, a law firm and she was not an employee. She was a 1099 person and she made, uh, she was going to probably make $200,000. This was earlier in the year and she was going to get hit on some pretty high taxes. So I was able to show, she got a trust and we showed her how she could basically take $194,000 of that money that she was earning as a 1099 employee, convert that to passive income for the trust. And she was only going to be taxed on $6,000 net income on her LLC because of this strategy. So we showed her, you won't, you probably won't pay any taxes this next year. And she actually started, you know, crying out of gratitude. She was so happy about that. And so what I'm trying to say is, is that this can work for the really rich. It can work for people even who make that kind of money. It's there if you do it. And and honestly, uh, again, someone who has, I have an MBA in finance. I have a 20 year, very successful career as a real estate investor. And I didn't know about it, but it's there. And you don't have to be, you know, super rich. Your children can be trust fund babies, not like the Kardashians, not like the Rockefellers. Your own children can be trust fund babies if you get this trust. And it's not nearly as hard as you think. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is definitely an important topic. As we get kind of closer to tax season, please follow, rate, review, share this episode to as many people as possible. And if you enjoyed this episode or the show, please be sure to tell a friend. Thank you so much for joining me today. I love it. I, thank you for being here. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.